Hello and welcome to video 12. In this video we're going to be talking about the end of the euthyphro and sort of in general what Socrates wants. Um, what, what it is that he's trying to do with these kinds of encounters. And um, it's here I think that we can see one of the biggest contrasts between Socrates and Plato and, and on the one hand and Confucius on the other. We get a really different sense of what uh, different kinds of philosophers they are, how they have different understandings of knowledge, and how they have different understandings of education in many ways. So um, we can break the dialogue up into three sections based on what definition is being proposed. So there's a prologue and an early definition where Euthyphro is uh, merely uh, giving examples. He's not answering in the way that Socrates wants. The second definition is uh, the one that, that is given in the form that Socrates wants. Euthyphro says that piety is what is loved by the gods. This gets derailed in the discussion of the Euthyphro question, that is, do gods love things because they are, whole, they are uh, pious or are they pious because God, the gods love them? Um, and so then we get this kind of scattered third section where they're dancing around the idea that piety is somehow attending to the gods or serving the gods. Um, and in the past, I, uh, in the first video on Euthyphro, I suggested that we can understand a lot of the method here in terms of what philosophers call reflective equilibrium. Reflective equilibrium is a process of developing rules, um, and you develop these rules by balancing intuitions about particular cases against the rules that cover those cases. So um, it's the logic of definition making. And it's got this basic idea. You, first you propose a definition, then you look for counterexamples. The counterexample could be something that got included by your definition, but that you actually want to exclude, or it could be something that was excluded by your definition that you wanted to include. And then if you find a counterexample, you either revise the definition or you revise your intuition about the individual example. So with the first definition of um, piety as prosecuting wrongdoers, um, it captures something that you might not think it, you want it to capture, prosecuting family. But um, Euthyphro says, I'm going to st stick with my definition here that piety is prosecuting wrongdoers and change my intuition about the case and say that, that piety is not... Uh, uh, or that piety really does include prosecuting family. Where he falls is, falls away is with a different kind, kind of counterexample, things that were not in the definition that should be, right? Um, praying and offering sacrifices. Oh, I'm one off on my subtitles here. Um, right? Um, so that leads him to revise that definition, right? So the second definition captures everything that we want it to. It succeeds this basic step at reflective equilibrium. Um, Euthyphro can say, this covers all the cases I want it to and only the cases I want it to. But it somehow fails to be logical. It doesn't have rich content the way that's, that, that Socrates wants. So that brings us to the third attempt, right? Um, and so the discussion questions I've got for this are what is the third attempt? How does Socrates undermine it? And then the final ones, which, I, which is where I think the real contrast with um, Confucius will come in is um, at the end of the dialogue, have we learned anything, right? Do the characters understand piety better? Do we understand piety better? Okay. 
So Euthyphro makes several attempts to um, talk about uh, pi uh, piety in this third section. And the central idea is that piety is the part of justice that is concerned with attending to the gods. Um, so if you're offering sacrifices, um, you are offering prayers, you're offering praises to the gods, you are caring for the gods the way that slaves care for their masters. And this is actually defined as a, a subsection of a larger um, moral virtue, justice. And this, again, is a, an example of uh, Euthyphro giving a definition in the form, at least, that Socrates likes, because he likes to have things categorized, like this is a kind of that and that is a kind of the other. Euthyphro also likes this because he says that uh, th this is a... The, this kind of, this definition of piety, it makes it a kind of knowledge, specifically knowledge of how to pray. Um, and again, Euthyphro likes this because this allows him to reassert his status as a religious expert, right? He is someone who has knowledge that other people don't, and that's why, for instance, he can see the future. This is also a, a bit. Uh, this is also a bit that Socrates likes. Um, Socrates strongly hints in a lot of these early dialogues that all of the um, virtues that he's asking about wind up being some kind of knowledge. Um, that in fact, virtue is knowledge of how to act or something like that. Knowledge or wisdom. Uh, but that idea is never spelled out because the dialogues never spell out really what Socrates is trying to do fully at all. So we might think that this final attempt at a definition is um, a good one, right? But Socrates shoots it down. If piety were attending to the gods the way that slaves attended to their masters, the gods would benefit from our service. But the gods are already perfect. Therefore, they cannot be benefited. Therefore, piety cannot be attending to the gods. Um, and at this point, Euthyphro is like, oh gosh, look at the time. I'm really tired of this game. Let's just, uh, I got to go to go, go to court, right? And this is, uh, this is common for the ends of these early dialogues. Um, the, the, uh, both Socrates and the person he's talking to walk away unsatisfied. So we've got some general questions here, right? Um, ha has Euthyphro shown himself not to know what piety is? Has Socrates shown that he does know what piety is? Do we know what piety is? Have we benefited at all from this, um, uh, from this, from this reading? Does Euthyphro's knowledge or lack of knowledge of piety make you think he is doing the right thing when prosecuting his father? So if this were an in-person class, we could just sit down and discuss these um, in small groups, but we're not going to. I'm just going to make some general remarks, and you'll have to think through them on your own. So in the past, I've mentioned that some dialogues are in the form of teacher-pupil dialogues, and that often this is a, a, a very old form format for philosophy to be presented in, right? So... The Analects of Confucius are essentially are short records of dialogues between Confucius and his students. Um, there was an early, a lot of early Egyptian literature consists of fathers and sons um, uh, get talking about virtue and ethics. Um, and in some ways, this seems to fit that general character in that it looks like Socrates is a teacher 
and Euthyphro is a pupil. But it's kind of a strange relationship, right? Euthyphro didn't, unlike um, the students of Confucius, or unlike the sons who seek advice from their fathers in the Egyptian dialogues, Euthyphro didn't come looking for knowledge. He was, didn't come asking to be taught. He was actually kind of hijacked, right? It's a strange thing for a teacher to do. Um, and the other thing is that Socrates throughout the dialogue consistently insists that he doesn't know anything. This is different than Confucius. Confucius is always giving him sort of an honest self-assessment of his state of knowledge. He says, you know, I know ritual. I know, um, uh, I know uh, propriety. I know how to honor the ancestors and parents, um, that sort of thing. I can talk about the classic works of literature. I'm working on understanding real goodness, right? That's the kind of self-assessment that he gives. Um, also, he still say things like, I'm about average at things like law and war, which is what other teachers would have said to be called themselves experts in at, at, at the time that he was working in. But he also th seems to think that those aren't important compared to ritual um, and learning and that sort of thing. Uh, so... <clears throat> Confucius gives an honest self-assessment of himself as a knower and then uses that, bases his teaching on that. Socrates consistently says that he doesn't know things. Um, and so this happens, for instance, at the beginning of this dialogue um, where uh, he says of his prosecutor Miletus, he's probably someone wise in seeing how in my ignorance I corrupt people of this generation. He also is always talking, he always says to Euthyphro, oh, you are so wise, you know, you obviously know a lot about religion, please teach me. So you have this strange inversion of a teacher-pupil dialogue where instead of a pupil going to a teacher who claims to know things and getting knowledge from them, the teacher says that they don't know anything and goes to the pupil and tries to get knowledge. So everything's reversed. Um, so I had mentioned that this, um, the Socratic method is sometimes called the Alenkis. Um, and this is actually the same word that's used uh, in Greek to describe courtroom cross-examinations. And that's going to be significant um, because, of course, there's going to be a cross-examination in, in, in the court trial coming up. That also gives us a sense of what, um, what kind of um, conversation um, we, it, Socrates seems to be having here. It's a little bit hostile, right? <laughs> It's a little bit like a courtroom cross-examination. There is um, some back and forth here. Okay. Um, aporia is another um, term. This dialogue ends with an impasse. That's what aporia means, impasse. Um, there's no resolution. No, we don't wind up knowing what piety is by the end of this. Okay, um, so the question becomes, what does Socrates want? There was something he wanted from Euthyphro and he's not getting it. Um, the Socratic method is, seems to be a way of um, interrogating people looking for this thing that Socrates thinks is important. So all of these cross-examinations looking for this thing have a similar pattern. Um, he gets someone to assert a thesis. He asks them to clarify it. And then he brings out a way in which that clarification contradicts the original thesis. So there is a sense that um, the aporia, the failure that comes at the end of this, 
is always a failure of logical consistency, and it's a failure to successfully explain or clarify a concept. All right. Um, why, why, how, how did this become a genre? Well, conversations with Socrates was a popular literary genre. There were dozens of writers who were recording these kinds of conversations. Um, only works by Plato and Xenophon describe their uh, uh, survive in their entirety. A lot of dialogues feature some kind of form of Lenkis, but they aren't necessarily about catching contradictions. This seems to be Plato's particular spin on this. So another thing to remember is I said that Athens had a really large and very argumentative ruling class, right? Um, uh, everyone had roughly equal power, so they spent a lot of time debating. And in fact, judged debates were a popular spectator sport. And so you can see how the Socratic Alenkis, the cross-examination, could grow out of that. But again, I, I still haven't answered the question that I initially asked, what does Socrates want? Well, it looks like he wants a definition. He asks Euthyphro for a definition of piety. And he wants that definition to be general and to have content. And this is the pattern in all of these. So this one's about piety. There are other dialogues about things like justice, virtue, courage, friendship, right? Um, and each time Socrates asks, what is the definition of this thing? And generally, the person he's talking to starts by giving examples. He says, I don't want examples, I want a definition. Um, and then the person proposes a definition, but it, um, and a lot of times the definition that gets proposed, there'll be hints that it involves knowledge somehow. So, uh, like, uh, piety is knowledge of how to serve the gods. Courage is knowing when to stand your ground and when to run away. That sort of thing. It's hinted that all, there's knowledge involved with all of these, or wisdom. Um, but it falls apart. So Socrates is looking for general definitions. Um, he's looking, this is a matter of rational inquiry. He's looking for an account. For Socrates, to know something is to be able to explain it. And this is different than it was for Confucius. Confucius would say that to know something is to be able to do it, right? So one of the things I have you, I, I ask in one of the exercises is, um, how does Socrates show that Euthyphro doesn't really know what he's talking about? Going back to a previous exercise where I asked you to remember a time where you discovered someone didn't really know what they were talking about. Socrates and Confucius have very different ways of figuring out whether someone knows what they're talking about. For Confucius, it's a matter of practice. If Confucius wanted to show or was wondering whether Euthyphro really knew about piety, he would look to see whether he conducted the rituals properly. Socrates is looking for something much more abstract. You need to be able to explain what you're doing in terms of reason. This is an idea of what knowledge is that focuses on um, words over actions. Um, and giving, being able to give an account, being able to give a theory, uh, it's far more bound up with, um, well, an argumentative culture, um, but uh, a um, the idea of abstraction. Socrates is a much more up in the air, aloof kind of otherworldly figure compared to Confucius. Confucius is a down-to-earth, practical person. Um, so we can think about, and I just want to ask three questions at the end here, 
Um, and again, if this was a real in-person class, I'd let you guys discuss these. Um, but uh, we can ask about whose approach to knowledge makes more sense to you. So is Euthyphro less pious for being unable to describe, to define piety, right? Um, he can't explain what he's doing. Does that mean he doesn't know what he's doing? Or that just that he can't put it into words? In general, there's an assumption with Plato that says that you have to be able to explain an idea in order to use it. Well, that's one way of knowing things. It may even be an important way of knowing things, maybe even be the most important way of knowing things. Um, I, 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 I don't know, but um, how you take a stand on this then um, is a big deal for how you move forward um, with your ideas about philosophy, with, about education, and about knowledge. Um, <clears throat> why bother trying to define ethical terms at all? This is an important idea for um, Socrates. And I guess uh, one assumption that we're, we make is that, well, Socrates believes that you can act, you can be more ethical if you understand rationally the meanings of the words you're using. Um, and this, again, means that ethics is tied far more to reason than it is to emotion, for instance. This goes, contrasts as not so much with Confucius, but especially with Mencius, his student, for whom emotion and the heart that cannot stand to see the suffering of others is a key feature in, is, is a key source for all of ethics. Okay. So I've got some open-ended questions about what Socrates is trying to accomplish. Um, it's different than what Confucius is trying to accomplish. Uh, in the next reading, we're going to take a look at uh, one of Plato's most celebrated metaphors for education. It's called the allegory of the cave. Um, and again, we'll, we might get a sense of what this will help us get a sense of what it is that Socrates is looking for when he asks about the definitions or concepts or ideas of things in the abstract.